Good evening. Every time I stand on a stage these days, I am filled with so much joy. It's been a while since I've gotten to see some of you, so um, thank you all for coming, and a good evening again, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andrea Douglas, and I am the Executive Director of the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center. Um, the Heritage Center its mission is to honor and preserve the rich heritage and legacy of the African-American community of Charlottesville, Albemarle, Virginia, and to promote a greater appreciation for and understanding of the contributions of African-Americans and peoples of the diaspora, locally, nationally, and globally. And so an event like this tonight, when we participate, we are in fact fulfilling one of the many ways that we um, meet our mission. And this evening, I am really excited to be involved in. Um, but first, I'd like to make some thank yous. First to um, the UVA Center for Politics and Tanisha Hudson of Legacy Productions for teaming up to make this event possible. We'd also like to thank the OWN channel for allowing us to share this film. We'd especially like to thank Kai Bo for joining us this evening, and to the director of the film, Deborah Riley uh, Draper, for being here as well. <laughs> Thanks is also owed to Red Light Management for supporting this event, or excuse me, sponsoring the event. Um, tonight, we're here to watch a film that tracks the rise of Black Wall Street in Oklahoma's Greenwood District up until the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre that destroyed the 36-block 30, booming business epicenter. This commemorative documentary shifts the narrative from the massacre itself to amplify the voices of those black pioneers then who went west to build their American dream. But first, we're going to see a public service announcement also directed by Deborah Bell, I'm sorry, Deborah Riley Draper. Um, and then we'll begin the program. So let's, um, can we roll the PSA? Step in my shoes. I've had someone tell me that they were concerned about getting the COVID vaccine because of the syphilis study. They didn't even know my grandfather was a part of the study. Tuskegee is a very sacred place. There is no way you cannot feel history. Think about the Tuskegee Airmen and all of the greatness that they did and then to find out that in this same space, such an atrocious study was being heaped upon our men. The study began in 1932. Segregation and Jim Crow were the structures of how our society functioned. What happened with the men and their families? It was the untreating of syphilis. The original title of the study is Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male. They were not treated for the disease that killed them, that made them blind. My great-great-grandfather, John Good, he was of the clergy, he was a farmer. He was a syphilitic in the study, and our family really didn't talk about it. Both of my great-grandfathers had been a part of that study. They were sharecroppers, and then later they were able to get land of their own. On my right here is Alec. Well, we call him Big Daddy. On my left here is Papa Frank Cooper, and he went blind at a young age. I am the daughter of one of the men in the study, Freddie Lee Tyson. I'm also the daughter of Johnny Mae Neal Tyson. I have to include my wonderful mother because the two of them was on the journey together. My uncle used to always run after us. We'll get your ear, I'm gonna get you. And we just run and run and run, and then we run right back to him. My grandfather and I were phenomenally close. He worked as a firefighter where the Tuskegee Airmen trained. Actually caught my first fish with my grandfather. My father had congenital syphilis from his mother. There were a number of opportunities for the men to receive treatment and they were very intentionally 
barred. And everyone involved in that study wanted it to go untreated until their death. Their body would then be sent to be autopsied to see the effect. Around 1947, penicillin became widely accepted and widely used. The doctors of the study prevented the men in the study from getting penicillin. The first thing those doctors should have done for these gentlemen was to make sure that each and every one was treated. It was the fall of 72. My brother Wallace read an article about the study. And a couple of days later, my father received a phone call indicating that he was in the study. When he found out what the study was really all about and that he had been used and treated as a guinea pig, there was just a lot of uh, shame. I'm so sorry. In comparing um, what's happening today with COVID, with what happened back in 32, I see more of a contrast than a similarity. A lot of misinformation is out there that is causing people to think twice or to hesitate. And one of them is the fact they think the men were injected with syphilis, and they were not. I mean, they were not injected with the spirochete that causes syphilis. They were not being treated. That is very different from what's happening with COVID-19. The vaccine is being made available to anyone who wants it. Too many people are using the study as a way of causing their own selves to deny access to vaccines that would save their lives. And when we talk about COVID-19, for example, we're not talking about the non-treating of Blacks. We're talking about the treating of all people. The ways in which COVID-19 ravaged Black communities show that we have underlying vulnerabilities when something like a pandemic hits. That, to me, really connects uh, what's happening now with a very important historical legacy. As a result of what happened to these men, it changed the course of American clinical research. It created the Institutional Review Boards, which is a very important intervention that says that there must be people who can examine every study that is done on human beings in this country. Wherever there's, there's research that's happening, there has to be informed consent documents that are signed, not just when participating in clinical trials, but also if you're going to get any type of a medical procedure, those things came because of that study. It boils down to truly understanding the concept of community, which is two words, common unity. The path from tragedy to triumph travels along the path of learning. I've taken both of my vaccines, and you're talking about something that happened to my family. We can't do this by ourselves. In order for us to be healthy together, we need to all be vaccinated. I'd like to introduce Deborah Riley Draper and Miss Lily Head, the daughter of one of the victims of the Tuskegee study. Good evening. Good. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for coming here to watch the legacy of Black Wall Street and to see the public service campaign about the United States Public Health Services study at Tuskegee. So one of the very first things I learned when I met uh, Ms. Lily Head, whose father was one of the men who, were, who was involved in this very important study, was get the name right. Get the name right get the facts right, and understand what, what happened. So with that, I want to take a very special moment to thank Ms. Head and all of the descendants of the 622 plus men who were involved in this study. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your candor, and thank you for being here. And I'd love for you to share with this audience what is the most important thing that you want people to take away um, about the name, 
about the men and about why you continue to fight for this particular legacy. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for being here. I'd like to first start with the name of the study. Voices for Our Fathers Legacy Foundation was organized in 2014 at Tuskegee University, the National Center for Bioethics in Research and Health Care. The descendants found after many years of learning and becoming more aware of what happened with the study that there was a lot of misinformation about it. And one of the first things that we wanted to address was the proper name of the study. It has been referred to, and still is, referred to as the Tuskegee study or the Tuskegee experiment. When Tuskegee is placed at the beginning of the name of the study, it places Tuskegee in the position of being the owner. Tuskegee is not the owner of that study. The owners of the study is the United States Public Health Service, Public Health Service syphilis study. They are the owners, the Public Health Service. They are accountable and they are responsible for that study. They were the ones who initiated it and who birthed it. Tuskegee was the place where it was unfortunately able to be held and conducted. So we want to transform that legacy by beginning with calling the study by its proper name and that is United States Public Health Service Syphilis Study at Tuskegee and Macon County, Alabama. That's very, very important. As to why we, the descendants, are continuing to help with eliminating a lot of the misinformation. And one of the main reasons why I'm here this evening is hopefully to share with you one fact that I find most disturbing, and that is the men were injected with syphilis. That is not true. The men were not injected with syphilis. And I hope you will help us to spread the word that that is wrong, that is not a fact. Having said that, it is believed by some as the reason why not to take the vaccine. There is no comparison between that study and what is happening today. We are able to get all of the information, be informed, and give our consent. The men did not know that they were even in a study. They also did not know that they were being denied the vaccine. Not vaccine, but the uh, penicillin, the antibiotic for syphilis at that time. They did not know that. We know, and that is part of my purpose and the foundation's purpose, is to dispel that and to encourage all of us to protect ourselves, our loved ones, and those around us by thinking seriously and getting vaccinated. It's important. We should not deny ourselves the vaccine vaccines as the men were denied the antibody. As to why uh, we are continuing to live up to our father's legacies, it is important that there's so many layers to this story and so many lessons that we can learn. 
And our foundation is hoping that we will be at this point in time, be an instrumental catalyst for change and promoting trust between the medical community and the public. It's important that we do that. We know there's a lot of mistrust and we want to change that attitude. So we're working hard to do that and we appreciate your time to listen to our mission. For me as a filmmaker, it was incredibly important to really dig into this story. Um, I thought I knew the story of the men. I didn't even know there were 600 men. Um, I knew the study lasted for 40 years. I knew the study came to the public when it was a whistleblower and the article came out in the New York Times in 1972 and Ebony Magazine, but I didn't have the facts. Um, and as a documentary filmmaker and a filmmaker in general, it's so important to be able to champion the stories that are intentionally or unintentionally dismissed or not disseminated um, in the fact-based way. So that's why I was happy to direct this uh, short documentary and the five public service announcements that are a part of this campaign because it's important for all of us to be the proper custodians of American history, and in this case, American medical history, because what came out of this study was actually triumph. Because of these men, everyone, regardless of race, creed, or color, has the benefit of informed consent. These men didn't, but we all do. And the other thing that was a result of the suffering that me, these men went through was the international, the internal review boards, which everyone gets to benefit. So if there's ever a study, if there's ever anything new, it has to go through that review board. So we're all indebted to these men for that particular contribution that they made across those 40 years. And we're thankful for all of the families who sacrificed so much and went through so much trauma and pain for us to have the benefit of informed consent. So for me personally, um, I was grateful to have that privilege and I'm honored to be able to share the story and share the very uh, facts around the study. So thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. We're excited to share even more tonight um, with the legacy of Black Wall Street because there is um, a parallel to being able to hear the stories of people who have a different lived experience than your own. It makes us all more informed. It makes us more empathetic. It makes us better as people because humanity is important. We all have to live and reside on the planet together. So it's important that we embrace our likenesses and our differences to make our entire world better. So thank you very much. Any I, last words, Ms. Lilly? I, I just like to, to echo the humanity part. Uh, the story is about humanity. It's not all necessarily about a group of black men. The story is about humanity. How can, especially those who are charged with saving lives and doing no harm, deny a person from being, or another human being, from being healthy and his family healthy. The impact of that study is last, has lasted for generations, since 1932 when it started, and it's still impacting us today. Look where we are, still talking about the study. So it's about humanity. And that is very, very important. So ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, we're gonna continue tonight's program. Um, I, in this moment, I have to thank um, OWN. Um, I love the network, I love the executives that are here today. Kai and Kristen, thank you guys so much for allowing me to direct two episodes um, on the network and for that to be a part now of Discovery Plus. So let's get on with the show. Thank you. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. So good to see you. Um, and thank you for coming out tonight. We're really proud to share our two-part special called The Legacy of Black Wall Street about a tragedy in American history now referred to as the Black Wall Street Massacre. The documentary tracks the rise of Oklahoma's Greenwood District from 1906 until the 1921 massacre, which destroyed over 35 blocks of homes, churches, and businesses owned by black families. Our aim was to amplify the voices of Tulsa's black pioneers while interweaving their stories with those of the inspiring modern day entrepreneurs who are striving to rebuild and reclaim the Greenwood District of Tulsa. When I was asked by the UVA Center for Politics and the film's director to represent Own and this film, I immediately agreed. But it wasn't until I began to research Charlottesville's history and arrived in town late last night that the gravity and honor of being here truly landed for me. As most of you know, in August of 2017, white supremacists gathered in Charlottesville, just a few blocks from here, to violently protest the removal of local Confederate monuments. Their clash with civilians and counter protesters resulted in, ter in a terribly brutal loss of life. Intentional and systematic racism in America was fundamentally at the root of, Charlotte, of the Charlottesville riot in 2017, just as it was at the root of the Black Wall Street Massacre in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. It is our hope that we can support the city of Charlottesville as it strives for healing and justice, as well as contribute to a larger racial reckoning that is long overdue in this country. We hope that you enjoy the legacy of Black Wall Street. Thank you very much. I'm sure that resonated for all of us here um, uh, in relationship to our own histories. Um, so I'm just going to make a little bit of adjustment in our schedule. We were originally supposed to hear from Dr. T um, Dr. Bell, and he is here with us now, so I'm going to have him come out and do his remarks. And once he's finished, then we'll have Kai Bao and um, Deborah Riley Draper out to discuss the film with me. So um, let me have um, Dr. Bell, if you'll come and make your remarks, please. Thank you. Hi, and thank you for the very kind introduction. So uh, my name is Tyson Bell. I'm an infectious disease and critical care physician. I practice at University of Virginia. And uh, that means I've been very busy, unfortunately, nowadays with COVID-19. And um, I think what's, what resonated with me with this story was just the power of knowing your history. Uh, this is a story that I wasn't aware of until I actually arrived in this community and, and when I went to the University of Virginia. Uh, but I did not know that there was ever a community like Black Wall Street where there was a level of black sufficiency, self-sufficiency, employment, economic opportunity that got destroyed. Uh, my colleague at the University of Virginia who's working there tonight is a white man who's actually from Oklahoma, went to the University of Oklahoma, and he did not learn of this story until he was in college as well. So just as strong as our bond and our connection is with storytelling, that's how, that's our social currency, that's how we tell stories. Just imagine how powerful it is to erase that story and to have it just completely gone from history. Um, that means that a black boy like myself growing up in Lynchburg, Virginia, just an hour away from here, does not know that story of economic opportunity and self-sufficiency. And what I saw was communities that were economically depressed around me. And so the easy thing to do to take away from a film like this is to divorce yourself from the present and say this was a moment in time where something terrible happened and isn't it great that we made so much progress and we're not doing things like firebombing black communities. But I think the harder thing to do and the more relevant thing to do is to think about 
this episode as a metaphor and to think, well, what are the ways in which metaphorically black and brown communities have been firebombed and economic opportunity lost? And what that means for someone like myself who's taking care of patients, um, the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 has had on our black and brown communities. And where does that come from? Because there's no genetic difference to explain what we were seeing at the University of Virginia and across the country, but it's driven by social determinants of health. And so what drives social determinants of health? It's lack of access to economic opportunity, lack of access to health care. And let's dig down deeper in what's behind that. Uh, it's the loss of economic opportunity by policies and neglect. So things like redlining, um, where communities of color face higher costs of capital to gain access to home ownership. And then even after gaining that access, cost of inflation rises higher, and so economic communities get literally depressed. Lack of economic opportunity means divestment from the community, lack of business investment, lack of future capital, in a spiral of low education, higher rates of public insurance, which doesn't reimburse at the rate of private insurance, which means that healthcare providers are not incentivized to come into these areas, which means that pharmacies like CVS and Walgreens are not incentivized to come into these areas. And then you have a community that is economically depressed, that has a lack of opportunity, that is sicker, poorer than other communities. And so when a virus comes that preys on chronic conditions, this is what you see. And I'll tell you, before COVID-19, um, there was a pandemic that went across the globe yearly that has a disproportionate impact on black and brown communities, and that was the flu. And that's what I used to worry about every year before COVID-19. And of course, you know what we're seeing now is a pandemic of epic proportions, but it's exploited this economic disenfranchisement and racism. And so I think the, the lesson to take from here is how do we fundamentally tear down the systems that have allowed this to continue? Because now it's about the system. It's not about these individual acts, but the system that's designed to perpetuate systemic inequality will continue to persist as long as you allow it to. And even well-meaning people who want to advocate for change, if the system is still operating the way that it was, it'll still produce the outcome that it was designed to produce. And so that's what I challenge you to think about um, coming from uh, this film. And uh, thank you for having me up. So I think Dr. Bell offered us a really interesting way of thinking about the film as well. I'm going to ask um, Kai Bo and, and, and uh, Deborah Riley Draper to join me on the stage so that we can continue this conversation. I'm going to try not to slip off this chair. Ladies, thank you so much for bringing this important film to us. Um, as I said just a little earlier, for those of us who live here, it resonates in so many ways. Um, and thinking about it, I fully understand, at least for Charlottesville, why it was important to, to have the film and have it be made. But Kai, I wanted to ask you first, um, why was it important for OWN to be part of, part of this project? Um, OWN has had a long-standing commitment to doing projects that allow our audience and the audience at large to see itself. Um, there's a mission of you know, seeing yourself. And so when you look at our programming, um, your experiences, your history, and your images are reflected back to you. And that was really important, specifically regarding um, the subject of Black Wall Street. We really wanted to tackle um, a documentary which hadn't been done um, before as an own spotlight and really um, 
at, you know, at the anniversary of this massacre, help our audiences understand not only what happened in Tulsa um, in the 1920s, but also really get a greater understanding of some of the challenges that we are facing this day. Right, right. And, and Deborah, the, the, the interesting thing that I, about the film is, is in fact this sort of present day contextualization, bringing us to that place where we're seeing the, not just the ancestors of those people who participated, but those who then inherit the, 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 the loss of it. Um, so I was wondering, and, and Kai, um, you started to talk a little bit about it, but tell me, Deborah, what do you want the audience to take away from this film? I think what's really important for all of us to take away from this film is to understand our collective history and to understand, to your point, that the past is with us because we can't disconnect from it and that we take those lessons that we see in the past, we learn them, we understand them, we develop empathy around them, and we use them to help develop a better future. Um, and if we don't do that, we will stay in this space of not learning, of not growing, and not maturing as a country and as a community. So what's important is that we understand that in our country, things need to change. And we look at examples of why they need to change, and then we embody this change, and we do something about it. So I want everyone to be inspired and active and really want to promote and encourage understanding of everyone's lived experience and use that to help move our entire country forward. Yeah. Um, just a quick question. How did you learn about the Tulsa story? Well, you know, um, it's funny. I learned about the Tulsa story in the process with Kai because um, I, I thought I knew the story I heard of Black Wall Street, um, but I only heard about the massacre. So all of the incredible 10,000 plus people who lived there and what they did and the things like cooperative economics and, and how they created a blueprint that we can all use for the future, I didn't know anything about that. I didn't know that Lula Williams was a black woman who owned three movie theaters. Um, so I found that incredibly inspiring. So I learned as we made this film together. Um, Kai and I were just talking about how much we learned about American history in the process of making these two episodes. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, you know, that's the kind of interesting thing. Even in the work that we do every day, is a, it's an uncovering experience. Every day, even as black people, we realize how little of our own story we understand. Um, or we know something, but then we dig a little bit deeper and it becomes a little bit more nuanced. Um, Kai, what is it, why a black filmmaker to do this particular story? What, what, the, how do you feel about having that relationship and that partnership? Um, well, obviously it was just a no-brainer, or maybe not obviously, but obviously for us. Um, we wanted to find a talented black woman who could helm this. Um, Deborah went above and beyond, um, not only intellectually, but in terms of her capacity to collaborate and for us to just really work together over a period of months. And um, I think that's indicative of you know, a shared experience. It's indicative of how much this meant to us, mm -hmm. you know, as black women. And it's also just part of, you know, OWN's larger mission, mm -hmm. again, of consistently hiring black female directors and making sure that, um, you know, both in front of and behind the camera mm -hmm. that we're represented. All right. So this, the, the, the film um, debuts in its anniversary in the 100th anniversary. Um, so creating a very significant space. It debuts um, in the beginnings of, of a Biden presidency and coming out of Trump and feeling somewhat hopeful. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm wondering how do you think about the work mm -hmm. of the film um, as it's being um, viewed by audiences? Um, how are you, first of all, first question, how, what have you heard from people in the audience? What has been the impact for you all um, 
as you've come out in, in, in spaces such as this? What have you heard from people? What have they said to you? I'll let Deborah speak a little bit more to the impact because I have been, you know, in the isolated, <laughs> <laughs> um, watching it, you know, just at home and watching it obviously as a uh, with my fellow filmmakers. Mm -hmm. um, what I do know is that some of the images. Wait, correct me if I'm wrong. Were we filming while we were like learning election results? Okay. We, we, <laughs> we were filming all the way past the inauguration. <laughs> right. So, so we were, as we were filming something that was, you know, extremely emotional for us, um, really poignant in terms of history, and also was highlighting again what was going on, you know, right. in terms of, you know, racial matters in the country um, at that moment. We were, you know, like living that, you right. know. And um, so I think that had an impact on all of us, and we did see that resonated. I got to see, um, you know, my fellow um, own network employees and, and coworkers just really going through this process all together. And it was mm -hmm. healing, but it was also difficult to see like how little has changed in some way and how much work we still have to do. Right. Right. And how about you, Jennifer? What have you been hearing? And, and how did... Well, I heard something that you said, too. Like, everyone was astonished that the Gap Band, yeah. you know, the song, uh, dropped the bomb on me. Most people didn't know that the Gap Band stood for Greenwood, Archer, and Pine, and that band was actually born in Greenwood, and the song was about the bombs and the, and the firebombing of a community, because everyone thought it was, like, just a super jam, right, that you hear at a party and you dance to. And, and, and I think that's very symbolic of this story. It has deeper meaning. It's more than just the smoke or the fire. This is about a thriving community that occurred uh, right after Reconstruction. And they really t took to the American dream in building a thriving, sustaining community. Um, and that's what people resonated with. People resonated with A.J. Smitherman. People resonated with Lula Williams. Um, so that's the feedback. Then the entirety of the story, for a lot of people, they'd never heard of. So they were completely shocked that it existed. Um, they were completely shocked um, that it existed. 10,000 people were made homeless. Buildings burned to the ground. People died. It was rebuilt, and it thrived. Then a highway came through it and crushed it again, and now, young entrepreneurs in Tulsa are being inspired by what happened 100 years ago to rebuild a community. So this idea of resilience really struck people and, and stayed with people in, in a really great, impactful way. Um, but for me, as, as art is always to inform and to inspire and to tap into your consciousness, consciousness around politics, around social issues, that's the point of art is to make us think, to make us have a conversation, to make us empathetic, so. Yeah, yeah. and I, as I said, um, I think that, you know, particularly for this community, the, even the sort of uh, journey that you just described, as you're talking about, you know, it rebuilds itself, a highway comes through it and it's crushed again. And, you know, we're living in that particular space, so. Um, I, I really want to thank you both for, for bringing this and, um, to us and giving our community an opportunity to see this because I think the, the depth of the research, I, and I, I need to applaud you both for the depth of the research, for the, the visualizations and how you brought those images to life um, for us, um, very compelling. Um, and then leaving us with a sense of possibility you know, with these young entrepreneurs working towards regaining that which um, were their legacy. Um, so I'd like to applaud you um, for doing that, and thank you all both for being with us tonight. Thank, thank you. you. I'd like to thank Kai. Um, thank you. I, I, I want you guys to know something that's really important. My network executive, Kai, is incredible, and she's smart. So a lot of what you saw was a real collaboration between the two of us, and I think there's so much power in storytelling, and thank you for having me um, and giving me the opportunity to tell it in a way that sits right with my soul. So thank yeah. you. And thank you. Um, one of the things that Deborah and I were talking about, because we, you know, we're both 
got here last night and immediately called each other and really started just sitting in like what this event was. And um, it's a full circle moment for both of us because we journeyed through this story and then landed here last night and both had done history, you know, and a little research about Charlottesville and what it's experienced, you know, over the centuries. And both of us were really in just a deep sort of reverent state of mind last night and today, knowing what um, some of the unfortunate, you know, and uh, terrible history in terms of race relations that are here, but also seeing that, you know, collectively people are trying to move on and, and move to a place of healing and move to a place of justice and telling stories like this um, and giving us a forum is part of that. And so we really appreciate you all for showing up. Thank you very much. Um, do you all want to take one question from the audience? Sure. Does anyone have one question that they want to ask? So the question is, what do they think is the most important thing to do to empower a teenager today? Um, I think that brings us to, and we won't get into it, but you know, the critical race theory conversation and debate. Um, mm -hmm. It is so important, even for all of us, to know our collective histories. And it's not just African American, it's white American. It is you know, the native people of this land. Um, it's just so important, period, for us to know the history and to know it accurately from a different perspective than we've been traditionally taught. So I think that is huge. And if it can be you know, in the form of a documentary or something easier and, um, than a textbook, I think it's helpful. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's a big part of it. Deborah, do you want to contribute? I was going to say, you guys are here. That's, that's like step one, right? <laughs> Participation and bring folks with you. So I, 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 think, I think opening up all of our aperture for more and for, and for things that are different than what we're generally exposed to, that works for children, that works for adults, that works for all people. So I think first step, being here, that's why Kai and I are so happy that UVA invited us. And we thank Glenn at the Center for Politics. But we thank all of you, because there are a lot of things you could be doing on your Thursday night. But you are here with us, and we thank you for that. So I'd like to um, really quickly call Tanisha Hudson and Glenn Crossman. Are you around? Just to come up and, and if you have a few words you want to say really quickly before we end the evening. Has Glenn disappeared on us? He likes to be in the background, I think. <laughs> He's definitely a background guy. <laughs> Come on out and be thanked for your hard work. I'm not going to say anything. Well, again, I just want to thank everybody for coming out. I want to thank Ms. Deborah Riley Draper. Um, Cabo. I didn't want to say your name wrong. <laughs> um, I want to thank them for coming. I want to thank the family from the Tuskegee Air Study, Dr. Tyson Bell. He always does an amazing job just talking about the effects of COVID and how we're disproportionately affected more than anybody else. Um, and I want to thank you all for coming out. And I hope that we take away from this today and understand that most black people have the same story. Doesn't matter what city you're from, doesn't matter what state, all of our stories are the same. The damage was done to all of us. And rebuilding is a very long process. Um, we've all been done wrong all throughout the history of America, but I think it's time that we reclaim our space and we reclaim what's ours and we start building and make it better. So, thank you.
<laughs> thank you, Tanisha. And thank you all again. Um, hopefully, we'll see you at the Heritage Center sometime soon. And if not, then we'll see you all here for events similar to this. So have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.